Hi, everyone. I'm Susan Glasser, uh, the editor of Foreign Policy Magazine, and I want to thank all of you, first of all, for uh, coming to see us this afternoon. I, I'm, I'm particularly delighted. I know there's tons of events here at New America, but I think, you know, this is one that, that personally is, is very exciting to me. Okay. Can you hear me now? Okay. Good. I'll, we'll be close. I'm Susan Glasser, for those of you who missed it, and I'm the editor of Foreign Policy Magazine, and I'm thrilled to welcome you here to New America this afternoon and appreciate you taking the time. We have uh, two wonderful panelists uh, to talk to you today, and the subject, of course, is Afghanistan, which is, which is particularly in the news this week. Anna Bodkin here, and Karen DeYoung. Uh, first, I'm going to put in a little bit of a shameless plug uh, for Anna's book, which uh, means she doesn't have to do it herself. Uh, but her book is Peace Meals, Candy Wrapped Kalashnikovs and Other War Stories, and you can get it right outside. There's a line in there in the, in the first chapter that really, I think, captures a little bit of what I hope we can talk about today. Uh, There's more to war than the macabre, is what, is what Anna writes. And I think anyone who's ever had the experience of, of being in a war zone, covering a war, uh, trying to understand that experience, finds this <coughs> in many ways the hardest part to convey. Uh, war is not all bang bang all the time. Uh, you know, I, I remember myself being in Afghanistan and, and covering the Battle of Tora Bora, where, where both Anna and I were. And some of my most vivid memories are of the pomegranates, which stained my fingers red, uh, almost as much as the B-52 bombers streaking over our heads and scaring the bejesus out of us. Uh, you know, I think of the dinners of, of Bread and Johnny Walker uh, that we ate on the rooftop of the Basra Hospital in Iraq uh, because there was no food to be found there, or of the sheep that a young warlord killed to mark my visit to an Afghan village. And it's, it's this notion that, that Anna, in her book, captures so memorably and powerfully. Uh, it's, it's something that covers all the hot spots of the last decade. It's uh, about not only Afghanistan, but Chechnya in, in her native Russia. It's about all the fault lines in the Middle East, uh, in Iraq and, and in Israel. Uh, and of course, it is also about the subject of our conversation today, Afghanistan. In, in fact, she tells you many things that you need to know about Afghanistan, but that you won't always get uh, from the newspaper. Uh, she tells you how Afghans were obsessed with the movie Titanic, even under the Taliban when they supposedly couldn't get movies. Uh, how she met people who she'd never talked to before who would risk their lives for her. Uh, how a dinner of green raisins and bread uh, could be the best meal you ever ate and how women reporters in that part of the world uh, were taken either for CIA spies or, or for prostitutes or perhaps for both, as the case may be. I won't tell you more about it except to say that it really is a great book and uh, you should read it. Um, Anna is a prize-winning reporter uh, and war correspondent. And I first met her when she was a columnist uh, in Russia for the Moscow Times. She went on to work for the San Francisco Chronicle, the Boston Globe, and, and many other news outlets, including foreign policy. Uh, in fact, she returned to Afghanistan this spring and wrote a very memorable series of dispatches for foreign policy, uh, traveling all across northern Afghanistan and rediscovering or trying to rediscover some of the people uh, and places that she had met along the way in her first tour in Afghanistan in 2001 and 2002. And, and that has also become a book, an e-book, uh, called Waiting for the Taliban, A Journey Across Northern Afghanistan. And I think the title, in many ways, tells you uh, some of the surprising things that, that she discovered there uh, in the north of Afghanistan, where, where frankly the Taliban had not even been firmly entrenched when they ruled the country, and yet over the last nine years uh, have made some very unexpected and surprising inroads in a place where uh, the aid and the promises have, have largely gone unfulfilled, uh, you know, and where uh, not just the men, but, but women in particular and children live in, in almost imaginably horrible circumstances. Um, to join us in this conversation today, I'm, I'm particularly thrilled that Karen DeYoung has, has agreed to be with us, because I don't know anyone who knows both sides of the Afghan 
story better than Karen. She is a senior diplomatic correspondent for The Post, a uh, member of the team that won the Pulitzer Prize uh, for their coverage after September 11th. She's the author of a great biography of Colin Powell. And uh, for our purposes today, not only is she the lead Post reporter who covering uh, sort of the ins and outs of war policy here in Washington, but she spent much time on the ground in both Afghanistan and Pakistan. And, uh, you know, as I said, in many ways, I can't, I can't think of anyone better to help us marry some ground truth uh, about what's really going on in Afghanistan with what the Washington narrative is. So, you know, what I thought we would do today is really have a conversation amongst the three of us and, and hope to get in as many of your questions as well as possible. But, you know, I, I thought I'd start off with Anna and, and ask you to give us a sense of, first of all, why you wrote the book and, and maybe take us up to the present day in what you found when you went back to Afghanistan uh, that you maybe didn't expect to find. Right. Okay. Um, thank you very much. That was a really, really nice plug, Susan. You know, if, if this thing doesn't work out with foreign policy, uh, consider you know a job as a public relations person. <laughs> um, um, the the book uh, is an attempt to reconnect with humanity of people whom we usually see as uh, two dimensional cardboard cutouts in some godforsaken distant battlefield. Uh, and I think the reason it is important to remember that uh, these places where uh, Americans and NATO troops fight the forever war, um, war has really been going on forever. In Afghanistan, war has been going on pretty much since the beginning of recorded history. So what to us seems like a very long war that we're trying to find an exit strategy to to Afghans is just the latest iteration of, you know, the latest scratch in a succession of blows that seems to have no end. Can you hear me okay? Okay. A little closer? All right. Um, so why, why is that important? And we were just talking outside about, you know, we hear the latest development uh, conversation with the Taliban, senior Taliban leaders maybe. Um, and, and the question I'd like to ask uh, is, and then what? Uh, let's think a little bit beyond what happens after the United States exits Afghanistan. So we have a country, 28 million people, who live pretty much the same way they lived uh, 2,300 years ago when Alexander the Great invaded Afghanistan. It actually was the only success, successful invader of Afghanistan. Uh, what happens then after after we do pull out? And that's the the conversation I think we need to have, even as we're having this much more immediate conversation about uh, the current events on the ground. Mm -hmm. In in northern Afghanistan today, what um, how does it differ from the the situation around Kabul? What what is your sense of of why? you know, this region has been sort of forgotten. And, and, I mean, to me, it was the most astonishing development of the last year to see that the Taliban could have made such inroads, uh, you know, in places like Kunduz and other places that even when they ruled the country, uh, you know, they never had a firm grip on. Well, Kabul is a bubble. Um, I'm going to do this. Uh, it's an exercise. Um, Kabul is a bubble. What happens in Nor what is happening in northern Afghanistan is uh, it was basically written off uh, after 2001 as a sort of part of the country that's immune to the Taliban, uh, where in fact it is a very deeply fragmented part of the country that is very multi-ethnic um, and it has pockets of Pashtun population that have a very interesting history. The Pashtun is it's okay. <laughs> the Pashtuns in Afghanistan, in northern Afghanistan, uh, were resettled there forcibly uh, in 120 years ago by an Afghan king um, as part of an ethnic cleansing campaign against the Uzbeks and the Hazaras. Uh, so basically, he took Pashtuns from 10,000 families of Pashtuns from south of the Hindukush and moved them without the right to, for them to move out uh, to northern Afghanistan. And Russia did the same thing with the Caucasus, and look where it got us. Um, so you have um, 
a history of ethnic cleansing that has never been resolved <coughs> in the territory that is populated by Hazara, Turkmen, uh, Pashtuns, Tajiks, Uzbeks, and everybody remembers episodes of ethnic violence that go back so many years, even before the Taliban took over. I spoke to this one man uh, in the spring, who told a Pashtun man, who told me how Hazara people killed his brother. Uh, it was at 4 o'clock on a Thursday, he said, 15 years ago. So the person remembers the time of the day and the day of the week uh, when one ethnic, members of one ethnic group attacked mem a member of another ethnic group. And I think that this is a very important uh, thing to keep in mind because these memories are very much alive and these memories are now being perpetuated by a new law called the National Stability and Reconciliation Law it passed very quietly this year in March. Um, right around the time, was it right around the time they discovered lithium, one trillion dollars worth of lithium in Afghanistan, which sort of begs the question, why can't that solve all our problems? We just lick the ground periodically and I'll be peaceful. <laughs> um, so, so yes, the National Stability and Reconciliation Law uh, is a tragic misnomer for uh, essentially a um, statute that grants amnesty, blanket amnesty to all warlords and all militias uh, who perpetra perpetrated um, ethnic cleansing crimes uh, and any war crimes over the last couple of decades. So essentially it tells Pashtuns, whose Pashtun women who have been raped and whose husbands were killed by, say, Hazara fighters, that their crime, their, uh, that they will never be vindicated. It tells Hazara people that the Uzbeks and the Tajiks and the Pashtuns who committed crime atrocities against them will never be vindicated. And that really is, to my opinion, in my opinion, it really is the key to, to continuous violence in northern Afghanistan, these crimes that just go, go on and on and on. Um, so Pashtuns think that the Taliban, which is mostly Pashtun, uh, will solve, will protect them. You know, Tajiks think that if the Taliban returns, there will be ethnic crimes against Tajiks, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, you know, that's where we're at in the north, um, which also should remind us that it doesn't really matter whether there is Taliban there or no, because these crimes will remain unresolved and they will, c will continue, uh, not on a government level, but on an ethnic level, the way they have for centuries. I think those are, those are incredibly powerful points, and it's a perfect point to ask Karen to sort of jump into the conversation too. What is it, listening to Anna's narrative of Afghanistan, in many ways it's very different uh, from the conversation that we tend to have here in Washington, which tends to be, you know, more like a sport <coughs> contest, right? You know, we're up, we're down. Uh, guess what? This week we're making progress in Kandahar, says says the papers. You know, what is it that we still don't understand about Afghanistan after so many years in the country? You know, I was I was thinking as as Anna was was talking about. Um, covering uh, Northern Ireland many years ago. And, and I was remembering going uh, one of these days of one of these big orange parades where the Protestants would go march on their national days and go march through cities basically to, to irritate the Catholics. And, um, they, and the Catholics did the same thing in the other direction. But on this, this particular day there were um, kind of elderly men with orange banners marching around with their big drums and, and uh, uh, all along the sidewalk were were people sitting in lawn chairs who were watching them as if it were kind of the Fourth of July parade here. Um, this was July 12th, which is a big a big day for the Orange in Northern Ireland. And um, I stopped and asked people why they were there and what was being celebrated. And to a person, they talked about uh, an event in the 17th century um, when um, James II was and William and Mary and I. The history escapes me at the moment. I used to know it well. but uh, And people actually pointed to an old stone bridge and said that's the bridge where somebody was pushed off and killed in 16-something or other. Um, I, I think Americans find this sort of inconceivable to understand. 
um, even with our civil rights history and and the history of immigrants in this country, I think there's an inability in this country for people to understand very deep ethnic um, historical problems, um, whether it's in Iraq, whether it's in Northern Ireland, um, whether it whether it's here. And and I was just working on a story today about India and Pakistan and talking to American officials who were like. Why can't they just get over it? Don't they see if they would just stop, if things would be better for everybody, and that there's all kinds of mutual advantages? Well, yes, but it just it just doesn't happen. Um, I think in in a place like Northern Ireland, you had all kinds of economic incentives, you had an education level, you've had to a certain extent a lot of reasons for people to at least begin to get over it, um, at least in their in their sort of daily life and in their political life, but. But I think in a place like Afghanistan, um, you don't have those incentives. And, and you also have a memory that uh, if you slip up one day, it's going to get you another day, long down the road, long after um, the Americans or whoever um, are gone. And, and I also think that um, you know, to the extent people agree on anything, what they agree on is that they don't want foreigners there. Um, and so, again, I think that when you're, when you're in Afghanistan and you're with U.S. forces, and we've all seen stories like this, you see these very nice young men um, in their early 20s, and they're lieutenant this or captain that, and they're going up and they're going into a village, and they ask to see the elders, and the elders gather around, and they have an interpreter, the Americans do. And the Americans, first of all, look very strange because they have all this stuff on and they're carrying lots of stuff and they have lots of nasty looking people around them. And the Americans are saying, what can we do to help you? What can we give you? And I think find it very difficult to understand when people look at them suspiciously or more often sort of tell them what they want to hear or what they think they want to hear, which doesn't bear any real relation to what's happening in their lives away from that particular moment where they're trying to figure out what the right answer is so they can either get something or get away uh, and, and not have this come back as something, as something to threaten them. So I think, so I think if, you look at, if you look at U.S. policy, if you wrote it down on paper as an equation, it totally makes sense. Um, we, the Americans, say, here's the threat here. This is what causes it. Um, in our experience, this is how you um, allow people to get over it and find a better life that, in fact, comports with what we would like them to do. Uh, and so if we just give them the tools, then it'll happen. And I think people get very frustrated uh, when it doesn't happen and try to look for, for people to blame. And certainly there are a lot of people to blame in this situation. Um, I, I think that as it becomes increasingly frustrating uh, and expensive in every conceivable way for uh, this government and maybe even the government that comes after it, certainly the government before it, um, I think that, that you see people looking for a way to redefine victory so that they can declare it and say that they did what they came for and find a graceful way to leave. Can I can I add something um, something that Karen was saying? Um, the Taliban is sort of like a catchword, and we seem we I think uh, simplify what Taliban means very much. And as Susan pointed out in the in her very nice plug in the beginning, um, people were watching the Titanic while Taliban was in power. It's no longer very popular in Afghanistan, but it was crazy popular in 2001. How did they all? You know, there was even a joke, Mullah Omar. Uh, on a fr at a Friday prayer, uh, tells his flock, uh, don't uh, shave your beards or else you will burn in hell. Don't uh, listen to music or else you will burn in hell. And definitely don't watch any movies or else your souls will sink like the Titanic. So, I mean, uh, I have, a, I have a, f a friend who told me he grew up in, uh, under the Taliban in Mazar-e Sharif for at least you know, five years uh, of his youth and adolescence was spent under the Taliban, he was telling me how they had all these musical instruments in their house, and every night, like they do today, they played these musical instruments. Nobody, and it's, you know, it wasn't very secret that they played music, and it was okay. 
Then again, um, I have another friend uh, also in, in northern Af Afghanistan who, whom I managed to visit uh, this year, and I'm not sure uh, it will be as easy, and it was not easy to get there because we had to go through some contested land. Um, and he, um, he has 13 children, two wives, and he's extraordinarily worried because the Taliban is closing in on his village. And I asked him is he, whether he was worried about the Taliban coming into the village, which actually had never been under Taliban control. And he said, no, I, am, I have nothing to worry about by the Taliban. I'm very religious. I already pray five times a day. My wives already can't go outside because I don't let them. What I'm worried about is the Taliban is going to come here, and then the Americans are going to come here. And they're going to raid my house, and they're going to bomb my village, and God forbid they're going to hurt somebody or scare the children. That's what I'm worried about. So this is not what we very often think about when we think about our advance you know, in Kandahar or our failures in Kandahar. But, but it's important for the 28 million people who live in Afghanistan, therefore, should be important for our strategy. So in a lot of ways, it's it, you know you've sort of highlighted the the two sides of the dilemma. On the one hand, uh, you, can you have peace without reconciliation? On the other hand, uh, the consequences of uh, searching for a mythic form of accountability in Afghanistan, right, are you know pretty apparent. We were talking before we came in about. Um, about these sort of current reports and, and what to make of them nine years into the war. And I'm just, I'm just curious, Karen, what, what your reading is of uh, where the Americans are at beyond clearly uh, a search for an exit, beyond uh, the political <laughs> wriggling that we're all going to be watching up to this July 2011 uh, uh, deadline that President Obama has set. Do you see anything actually different occurring uh, since General Petraeus has taken over? Yeah, I do. Um, I think that uh, if you notice that the, the sort of mantra of U.S. officials at the moment is is that we're making progress. And this is very different. This is just in the last two months or so. I think before that um, they were very – no one would say we're failing, but I think they, they were very cognizant of the fact that things in Helmand were not going as quickly as they would like, although by their definition they're, they're moving somewhat. Um, the – Offensive in Kandahar, which was supposed to start um, much, much earlier, uh, was delayed and delayed and delayed and, and now, in fact, has actually started. I think what's different now is that um, there is a strategy. Uh, they are trying to implement it. General Petraeus came in wanting to vastly increase um, um, intelligence resources, both technical and on the ground. Um, they they feel like they've got the whole country covered from overhead now and can see everything that goes on. Um, the, the special operations forces have about tripled there and and away from what people like me would see when we when we go there, um, they are um, I think really going after people that they perceive to be to be uh, Taliban kind of mid-level and, and up commanders on the ground. Whereas before, they would fight an engagement, they would go into a place, there would be a kind of firefight, and the uh, insurgents would, would go away to wherever they go, and the troops would basically just sit there and then kind of try to move incrementally farther out. Now they're they're using this intelligence um, to to really go after them in a, in, a, in a much more offensive way. They're out in villages. They're doing a lot of targeted killings. They're doing a lot of overhead killings using their drones. Um, they say that uh, this is having an effect. That the Taliban is getting dispirited. Uh, that they um, that this has something to do with why people. Um, some people at least want to talk now or want to reintegrate. Um, the, the, the problem is, at least from a journalistic standpoint, is that we have no way to prove this. Um, we have, uh, to the extent that, that journalists go out with troops on these so-called embedded reporting trips, um, I mean, you, you see a lot of what you can see when you're traveling with U.S. troops. Um, and I think that it's it's very difficult, particularly in, in the places around Kandahar, which is where most of the action is right now, um, where you're really not in a position to go off by your own on your own. Um, so I, I think we just don't know 
at the moment. I know that uh, you know the administration has said that they're going to have a, a sort of review in December, kind of where we stand. Uh, that General Petraeus has told the president that he will come back and report whether or not there's been progress in five separate areas. One of them is this uh, targeted killing and capturing of people that they have identified as mid-level and upper-level Taliban um, um, leaders on the ground, again, inside Afghanistan, not the ones in Pakistan, although that's a sort of different objective. Um, they feel at this point like, yes, they're going to be able to report big advances there. The second one is how many um, lower-level fighters uh, have, have joined these reintegration schemes. Um, I think the figures there have been disappointing up until now. Uh, they say that they're starting to pick up, but I don't think we've actually seen the evidence of that. Um, I'm trying to think of what what the other components of the five are. Oh, that they can that they can actually take and hold and begin development projects uh, and governance projects within these areas around Kandahar uh, that have always been or long been the the uh, sort of province uh, and headquarters of the Taliban. Um, they want to do some um, progress in governance and and anti-corruption. And there's a fifth one I can't think of at this time. But in any case, uh, I think that they feel that these are signs of progress. Now, again, it's just very difficult to tell um, for, for anybody uh, who's on the outside of that, of that process. So I think, I think we'll just have to wait and see. I mean, when I, when I talk to, to Afghans, and, and obviously I don't talk to people, nearly as many people as, as somebody like Anna does, uh, or people who are kind of grounded uh, as, uh, in that way, um, they say, um, you know, yes, the Taliban still think they're winning, um, and they probably are, but they perceive kind of divisions among them uh, where they're starting to look ahead in a strategic way and say, look, the truth is the Americans are going to leave. Um, we're not going to take over the whole country, and most of them don't even want to take over the whole country. What's the best way to position ourselves so that we have a piece of the pie uh, in this country? Um, maybe it is to begin talking uh, to, to, to Karzai and to his government and to figure out what parts of the territory we can continue to hold sway in, uh, whether they're the parts that we want, um, whether we can, uh, to the extent that they uh, want to have a role in the central government, what's the best way to do that and what can they get, and that at this particular time they're probably best positioned to start having those talks. Um, that's not anywhere near um, all of the Taliban, uh, which is, despite U.S. intelligence, I think seeing it to their advantage to describe this as one big group that is all under some kind of central command and coordinates all their actions. I think even U.S. intelligence believes that it is a collection of very different groups, some of whom talk to each other, some of whom sometimes coordinate things, some of whom have nothing to do with each other. Because you also have to look at the statistic, which even the Americans say, which is that most of the people who are fighting are fighting within about six miles of where they actually live. Um, so. I, I guess that's a long way of saying I, I think we don't know. They're claiming progress now. Um, I think that uh, all of this is keyed toward next July and how many and how many people they will begin to pull out, how they will reposition people, what happens with the Afghan security forces. Um, I think the fix is already in in terms of, of what parts of Afghanistan they're going to declare eligible for transition to Afghan security control, and they're all going to discuss this at the NATO summit uh, next month in Lisbon, uh, and then turn it over to Karzai, who will then announce it, and then it will happen by next July, and they'll begin to, at the very least, pull some troops out of certain places where they're not actually fighting anyway, and perhaps reposition them in other areas and bring a few of them home. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I want to let Anna respond to that, but quickly, I. I think your point about the Taliban and really being the Taliban plural, uh, many different Talibans both in Afghanistan and in Pakistan, is, is a really important one that often gets lost in the Washington part of the conversation. Uh, I know some of you picked up copies of our latest issue of 
foreign policy, and there's a very good uh, sort of map and piece in there by our New America colleagues that makes that point and that, you know, sort of really guides you to sort of the Haqqani network is, is really a different group entirely uh, than, the, than the Taliban that, that Anna encountered, you know, certainly the, the re refractions of in northern Afghanistan, for yeah, example. Well, I don't even know if yeah. there were. I think I, I'd like to actually follow up on what Karen was saying. It's a very important point. The idea that after Americans leave, maybe there will be a division of the country. And I, I'd like to add to that that um, – it's not that dissimilar to what is already going on with the so-called Mujahideen. And the w another thing to keep in mind is that the Mujahideen are not that dissimilar from the Taliban. They just happened to be fighting with each other in 1995 and 1994 and 1996. The Taliban are fighting with each other now or, you know, disagreeing with each other now. But, you know, who are the Mujahideen? They're, the, they're holy warriors who fought against the Soviet invasion. Now, the Taliban could position themselves as, a ho as holy warriors who are fighting against the American invasion. So in that sense, they're not, they're, their ideology is not that dissimilar. Their way they operate is not that dissimilar. They also, the Mujahideen also had split up sections of the country. You know, the Uzbek commanders were in their parts of the country. The Pashtun commanders were in their parts of the country. So it's actually, um, I think that we very often... Um, think of them as completely dif different uh, things, but they're, they're not. They're actually representatives of the same mentality in a way, and therefore the way they act is very similar. So it's possible that what we'll have is just a, 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 an even more fragmented Afghanistan. Then, you know, there will be another battle for Kabul like there was in, in the early 90s, and somebody else will use that to take control. But I, it, I think it's also important to say that... that um, that the the administration actually does have a strategy, and and whether one agrees with it or thinks it will work, the, the strategy is that you will use military force to push bad guys, as they call them, um, out of contested areas, and then you will initially by using um, foreign forces and ultimately by using newly trained Afghan security forces you will secure those areas for long enough to bring in economic assistance, uh, some semblance of good government that provides services to the people, and that people will gradually come to see the advantage of a system like that and, and begin to trust their own, um, their own government uh, to the point that when the foreign forces leave, um, there will be a lot of economic assistance left behind, and if the bad guys try to come back, um, people will say, no, we don't want you here. Or, or bad guys from that area will say, I don't want to be a bad guy anymore. Actually, it's to my advantage to participate in this system now because I can get the assistance I need and I'm not being charged bribes by everybody from the cop on the beat to the, to the governor. Um, and so life, life is better now. Um, that, that's the strategy. Um, I, I think whether it'll work or not, I don't know. <laughs> Anna, one thing that, you know, when people often write here in Washington about uh, Afghanistan, and in particular President Karzai's government, they talk about the explosion of, of corruption. Um, I'm wondering, though, if you, if you found dramatic sort of evidence of that increasing in a huge way, or if it's really just the nature and form of it that's changed over the last uh, nine years since the uh, war after September 11th. Did, does it feel like there is a whole new level of corruption in Afghanistan? Does it feel like maybe it was always there and we just didn't, didn't get it before? It feels like there was no government before and now there's kleptocracy in, in, in Kabul. Uh, and I, it's... You know, everybody I spoke to in northern Afghanistan and in central Afghanistan uh, would laugh at the notion, at the the idea uh, that uh, somehow the government would bring something good to them. Right by now, they you know they'd be laughing uh, because the only because they don't trust the government. They know that the government steals. Even mem even people who work for the government tell you the government steals. You know, I I can't tell you how many empty offices I've been to where there's a bureaucrat sitting in front of a completely empty table saying, you know, not even saying anything, just sort of lifting his p empty palms up to heaven, saying, well, 
you know, I have nothing because the government is stealing everything back in Kabul. So the idea that we're, we here in Washington are going to hope to use some sort of incentives um, channeled through the Afghan government will be laughable to most Afghans just because they don't trust the government. Uh, the idea of, the very interesting idea of reintegrating uh, low-level or even really low-level Taliban fighters into society is also very strange given two things. One is um, thousands of refugees are returning back from Pakistan, uh, refugees who had families that had fled the Soviet invasion, you know, 20 years ago, 17 years ago. Now they're coming back because the Karzai government is inviting them back, and then the Karzai government is dumping them in infertile deserts with no access to health care, no access to jobs. Uh, and they, these people are becoming uh, recruited by, by the Taliban in the north, for example, because they have absolutely nothing. So what are, the question I have, one of the questions I have is what are we going to, how, if we can't support, you know, I don't remember what the number was, but I think it's like 17,000 pe people a year. If we can't support these people who never fought against anybody and they were just, you know, living in refugee camps in Pakistan, uh, how, what, are we, what kind of jobs are we going to offer uh, Taliban fighters who are going to come and you know, switch sides? And the other question I have, and this was actually very ironic, uh, uh, in the Sunday New York Times, I opened the Week in Review first with uh, Dexter Filkins' story about what Karen was mentioning, this idea of you know, inviting the Taliban to join, uh, and it compared, uh, mentioned the awakening councils in Iraq where uh, what, 100,000 insurgents were invited to switch sides, and they did, and formed these awakening councils. And the page one story of the very same newspaper explained how these insurgents, or hundreds of them at least, have woken up and said, wait a second, where am I? What am I doing here? I'm an insurgent. I'm going to go back. So, you know, now they're joining Al-Qaeda and Mesopotamia, and, and, and except now they understand the way Iraqi security forces work and coalition forces work a little better than they did before they became awakened and then woke up. It's confusing with those terms, but... I, I just want to say on the, on the corruption thing um, that one of the, one, one of the big problems um, that I, th I think the uh, administration totally recognizes, the military totally recognizes, they've done lots of studies on this, they have commissioned academics to do studies, they have commissioned Afghans to do studies, is that to the extent um, that, that we are pouring money into Afghanistan, basically what we're doing is, is magnifying this, this uh, kleptocratic society that, um, that even in their own surveys, they say that most Afghans believe that the more money that comes to their part of the country, the more money will go to the people who run that part of the country. Um, so that, again, this is part of the huge conundrum of this situation, uh, and it's not, it's not that they're not aware of it, but when you're putting, when you're spending a hundred billion dollars a year, uh, which is, I think, eight times the GNP of, of Afghanistan, um, that money goes somewhere, and the people who get that money generally are the people who have always gotten the money. They just get more of it now, which makes people even more angry at their government, and and this is part of what makes this whole situation so complicated and so difficult. And also angry and also angry at the inter international community, right. because Afghans think that we're knowingly doing this, right. and so they're right. blaming us for maintaining this kleptocracy. Uh, you knew I was going to ask for questions, yes. Um, when you do uh, stand up to ask questions, if you could just tell us your name and, and where you're from, that would be terrific. And since you anticipated, you can start. There are some allegations that there are no talks going on at all. <clears throat> this is a maneuver where to create doubts about among the low level and mid level, <coughs> their bosses are talking to the government, so we should also go and join them. Is there any truth to that? I, 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 there may be some truth to that. I mean, I, I, for example, was quite surprised that General Petraeus uh, felt the need to publicly say that NATO was facilitating talks. Um, and I couldn't think of any reason beyond that. He was sending a message to various people. I mean, it's not something he sort of said by accident when some reporter cornered him. He clearly meant to say it. Um, and so there was a reason for that. At the same time, uh, 
the stories that I've written about this haven't come from U.S. officials at all. They've come from from Afghans. They've come from people who have participated in this. They've come from, from people in the region who have been in the room with these talks. I think what we don't know is those Afghans uh, who have come forward and said, I am, I am a senior Taliban official, and, and we know their names and, and, and um, what they theoretically represent. Uh, what we don't know is if the very top people have said, go and speak on my behalf, or if people are just trying to position themselves now for what they think may be coming down the pike. And I think that that's not clear at all at this point, whether whether those people who are having these very preliminary talks are having them on behalf of people who actually have the power to implement any kind of agreement. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was just thinking about this uh, story I kept hearing all over uh, Afghanistan in, in the spring about how Americans are airlifting the Taliban into northern Afghanistan and dumping them there. And at the time, it seemed like well, a complete conspiracy theory, which Afghans are so good at. But now I'm beginning to think, you know, maybe they were airlifting them for talks, although why, why Kunduz, I wouldn't venture to guess. I think that another thing that's important to say is that um, Afghans know each other. Um, these are not the Taliban right. and the Afghans. You know, I was talking a couple of weeks ago to a guy from the um, Hezbi Islami, who's a who lives here in the States. I mean, he's an Afghan-American, and he participated in the talks they had last year uh, with the Karzai government. There was a five-person delegation from from uh, Hekmatyar's group, and they had talks, and everybody knew about it. Um, and and so I was asking him, well, so, what, you know, what do you know about the Quaid Ashura? What do you know about the Haqqani people? You know, are they talking? He said, well, I don't know. He said, you know, my mother's family's from Kandahar, and so my cousins are in the Talib, in the you know, the Taliban in the south, and they're with the Kandahar people, and so if I want to talk to them, you know, then I call up my mother and I get her to, and then I meet with so-and-so. Mm -hmm. And I think that it reminds me of, I remember covering wars in Central America where, which, these very, very small countries where pe people know each other, you know, they, it's, they're, they're often part of the same family. Um, and so um, I think that, um, I think they've always talked to each other. Uh, whether they're talking about something more than that, some kind of political settlement now, uh, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, this woman in the back, yeah. Hi, Medea Benjamin, Code Pink. Um, I wonder about, uh, Anna, well, both of you, if, if you feel that women's rights have just been in Kabul and that's about it. And then in terms of these peace talks, I don't know which peace council it is, but one of the ones that was set up recently that had 70 people on it, they said there were a only eight women as part of it. And uh, I wonder if you think that whatever peace talks are happening, um, how is there, what, what are the possibilities that even the minimal women's rights, like in the Constitution, uh, would be uh, part of those peace talks? Medea, are there women's rights in Kabul? Mm -hmm. You know something I don't know. Um, I, I, met, I met a woman who uh, is 19 years old. She has a three-year-old daughter. She's going to pay $10,000 and give that three-year-old daughter to her husband who pimped her to his friends so that the court would grant her divorce in mazar -e sharif historically one of the most liberal cities in Afghanistan. So that's my take on women's rights there. But I, I, would, I would be interested in, in what you think... Afghans want, and, and to what extent you think people there are willing to sort of fight for that and consider that one of the things that's, that's important to them? Uh, it's not. Uh, I mean, it's, it's important to that woman, uh, but Afghans are not. It's, a, it's still an extraordinarily conservative society, uh, and, and it, it's always been conservative. I mean, we see those wonderful photos. I think foreign policy had those wonderful photos from the 50s with women in pencil skirts, beautiful. Um, but uh, I, I don't see a lot of political will on any level to do anything about women's rights. There are some, you know, some small groups of, uh, some small NGOs that, that work uh, 
and literally what they do is they try to help these poor you know women like that woman to get to get divorced mm -hmm. but i mean you're not saying y you've met of course individual women who do care you know about getting out of a bad marriage or i mean the school teacher who was able to go back to school um you know after teaching underground during the Taliban, that sort of thing. But your point is just that uh, there's no constituency, there's no actual political constituency there? Uh, my point is that it's definitely not a priority. Uh, and here's another example. Uh, USAID helped in one of these refugee resettlement camps, and they built a bunch of things that are completely useless. One of them is a school for boys that doesn't work because there are no teachers, but that's beyond the point. The point is that there is no school for girls that the Americans built. They built a clinic that doesn't work, a playground that nobody uses, and a school for boys that doesn't work. They didn't build a school for girls that doesn't work. So it's not a priority, not just for Afghans, it's not a priority for, and it, nobody's saying this is, you know, this is a priority. I mean, they're saying it's a priority, but they're not showing it, they're not doing it. Mm -hmm. Does that, do you agree with that, um, I, I, on the ground, I don't really know. That's why I was asking. I think in terms of U.S. policy, certain, certainly Secretary Clinton has said this is a big priority of hers. On the other hand, I think that um, certainly U.S. partners in Europe, as they try to figure out their way out of this, uh, it's not a priority for them. Um, and I think that you, you hear people – I was this weekend in Rome at, the, at a conference of the – so-called international contact group of all the countries that have troops there, and a lot of, a lot of Muslim countries, and the and the OIC, and even the Iranians were there, um, and and the what they what they were talking about was the preservation of what they called essential human rights, um, and I think essential human rights to them are no torture, um, you know, all the kinds of things that we would think of. I, I don't think that that extends to um, um, opportunities for women or things that they see as culturally ingrained. Um, this is the way they talk about it. Um, and so even though Secretary Clinton, every time she's in the region, and I've sat in these meetings where she meets with incredibly articulate, very smart, very engaged Afghan women, uh, and, and has committed herself to that over and over and over again. I think when push comes to shove, that will be pushed down the priorities of, of um, mm -hmm. the, the coalition. Mm -hmm. Okay. We'll try to get a couple more uh, there on the side, and then we'll come up here. Thank you. Hi, my name is Matt Southworth, and I work for the Friends Committee on National Legislation. I also served a tour of duty in Iraq with the U.S. Army in 2004. I'm wondering if you guys could maybe comment on the recent elections in Afghanistan, um, parliamentary elections, the fact that they were plagued by violence, and the fact that um, now 80% of the candidates have called for those elections to be thrown out and another one to be held within a year. What does that say about our counterinsurgency strategy, which calls for a legitimate governing partner and uh, Afghans' relation to that partner? You should answer that. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Um, I, I think that it's a society where the, what we think of as elections don't come that naturally, and you obviously had all of the security problems. Uh, I think the hope is that while nobody expected it to be perfect, uh, and it certainly was far from perfect, the hope is that you will begin to not only come up with some kind of represent, representative um, group, uh, that represents all of the different ethnic groups and, and all of the different factions, but that you will also create a counterweight uh, to, the, to the government that's been centralized in the palace in, in um, President Karzai, which I think that certainly the United States and, and a lot of their partners there have come to realize uh, that the system that they pushed so hard to be imposed in, in Afghanistan was perhaps not the best system for Afghanistan. Um, I think that uh, the, the, the hope was that there would at least be a parliament uh, that would be, as I say, willing to be a counterweight to the executive. But I think what they're looking at now is to try to, um, um, maybe not through elections, but more through traditional shuras and, and district councils and, and, and village councils, 
um, almost separate the, the government in Kabul from, from lower levels so that people feel that they have more of a stake. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I just get the feeling that most Afghans, the, the whole concept of, of what happens in Kabul is so abstract and remote. Um, you know, they, they actually have, and I'll be very brief, they have a, a functioning form of government a, a very local, on a very local level. And you may be familiar with that in Iraq, you know, the sheikh. Uh, I actually spoke to a sheikh once in 2003 in Iraq. He said, democracy, bring it on. We'll have democracy. I'll be sheikh. There'll be democracy around me. Mm -hmm. So they have that. And it, and it actually works. Uh, uh, and on a, but on a very local level. So if, uh, you know, your cow overruns my cow, uh, I take you to the sh to the local elder, uh, and he will decide what to do about us. Uh, but I there, but there is the the idea, as Karen pointed out, the idea that somebody in Kabul will stand up for my stand up for my rights is absolutely alien and inconceivable. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're almost out of time, so I'm going to get uh, right here in the front row, and then we'll see if we have time for one more. Great. Okay. Well, we can. No, we can. Afghans. We don't want to hear from <laughs> Afghans. Sure. We just no, want to we'll tell you what Afghans think. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We'll do. We'll, we'll do. Women's rights are not a priority here. So. <laughs> um, I'm Mitzi Worth. I'm with the Naval Postgraduate School. Karen, I want. I want to ask you about language and something that's bothered me from the very beginning. Indeed, it came from the military, but I see the press continuing to use it, which is the words winning and victory. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe the United States can claim that since 1945. And it, it would be helpful in terms of creating expectations in this country if you could find other words, because those terms just aren't a part of what is ahead of us. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, that's a criticism you could make of a lot of journalism. Um, you know, we deal in um, shrinking things, um, in in saying big things in few words, and and you're absolutely right. I mean, um, you know, you can you can look at the president's definition of what what victory is. I mean, although he doesn't call it victory, I mean, they're very careful not to say that. Um, you know that it's a, it's a stable Afghanistan that does not permit Al Qaeda to establish itself there and is representative of its own people. I mean that's sort of and doesn't pose a threat to anybody. That's it. Uh, is that victory? You, you can call it victory. It's or you can call it uh, win, which is a much shorter word for journalism terms. Takes up less space. So. <laughs> Okay, you get the last word. Oh, thank you so much. My name is Shakila Kalji, and I actually, and I'm a recovering journalist, but I also work. <laughs> I'm the director of public affairs of um, an NGO called Afghans for Tomorrow in Afghanistan. We have schools for girls for the past nine years, and I'm pretty proud to say that we sort of basic education provided for at least um, 100 plus in all the schools we have, two in Kabul. And we also work in volatile regions such as Wardak. We have a health post. So um, hearing to three, my favorite three ladies in the planet Earth um, when it comes to journalism and all that, I'm so lucky to ask. I wanted to ask you actually and all of you about um, the status of women's rights in Afghanistan. I'm just reading. This isn't my page. I don't want to go on and on. But I agree with you that um, the women's rights issue is in the very back burner. And I always hear from both sides, international community and also Afghans, when I bring that uh, issue up, they say, well, Shakila, you know, you expect too much. There's so many much more important things to deal with than the women's rights. So that is insulting at so many levels. But I think status quo has to stop somewhere, sometime. And if we keep on making that as an excuse that, you know, in a traditional society such as Afghanistan, I think we should just put that aside and deal with the war and winning and losing. And that will never change. And, and there are a lot of progress in, 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 in women's rights and movement. There are brilliant women, as she mentioned. Um, but I think the, the women's rights issue cannot be approached from the Western point of view, as everything in Afghanistan, as you can imagine, you mentioned the complexities of, of everything, including the enemy and the, and the, and the government, the corruption. 5% um, of the women have judiciary rights, and even then it's a joke. Um, 
the parliamentary members, they have no voice, they're sitting there, but it's just symbolic. The, the Constitution is written to our benefits, but nobody's implementing it. So there's a lot of problems, but also there are a lot of progress in a very low-key way, and my organization is one of them, and there are a lot of other NGOs, people from all sides, international community, that they do make a difference, but it is a long process, and I think the West, and as we also know, look at everything in a very black and white way sometimes. We need sort of results, and we need to put it in boxes, and if it doesn't uh, it doesn't make sense to us, then therefore whether it give up or or not, uh, women are very much fearful to even lose the symbolic rights they have now after the so-called negotiations with Taliban that is underway um, in the peace talks. So I wanted to ask all of you, I, I, please tell me what, what do you think is going to happen? So thank you very much for giving me uh, What do we think is going to happen with, with women? Uh, we could have just started the conversation on that and continued for an hour. Um, I don't know. I think that there, first of all, a large chunk of the country uh, lives the way it lived uh, when the Taliban was in power because the society is very traditional. Um, I also met a lot of Pashtun women to whom the National Stability and Reconciliation Law told that the government and the international community don't care about them because uh, they are basically saying the the warlords whose militia militias had raped these women and killed their husbands and killed their sons are going to walk free. Uh, and for these and these women have told me that they think that the Taliban maybe, if they return to power, maybe they will protect them just on the ethnic uh, on uh, basis on on the grounds of sharing the same ethnicity. So it's again it's a very it's very complicated. It's, I think just as women's rights cannot be segregated into some sort of uh secondary category uh as when we talk about what to do with, with Afghanistan, women's rights cannot be segregated into a se separate category in terms of what we talk about when we talk about the future of Afghanistan. It's all it all has to come at once. And I agree with you. You can't say first bring us food and then women's rights. It all has to happen together, so. Because there are the 40% of the population and yet they have no voice and I hear that over and over again that, you know, we should just put these women's rights issue at the back burner right? simply because we have much more important things to deal with. But that is part of the important deals to deal with. So. Yes, I agree with you. Thank you. Karen, do you have anything more to add? Well, I think that's an important note to end on and I really appreciate all your time today. Uh, and uh, do come, uh, Look at the book. Uh, I'm sure Anna will be happy to, to sign your copy. And uh, thank you again for coming.